you right there in your little body of your little life you can make this a golden rule day because the greatest teacher who ever lived said that your problems are not what's insurmountable what is insurmountable is the love and power of god the kingdom of the heaven that is right here in your midst and my midst today so the question i want to pose is which game do you want to play Here's the beatitude that we're looking at in the Sermon on the Mount, it's the beginning of the sermon. And the third one Jesus pronounces is, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Which of course raises the question, what was Jesus smoking? Because it doesn't work that way, not in our world. One commentator by the name of Hunter writes this, for our contemporaries, no beatitude is more embarrassing than this one. Jesus seems to promise world domination, they will inherit the earth, to the meek. Where in reality, everyone knows that the weak, the meek, are always trampled down. What's going on here? I've been kind of looking forward to this one because I will introduce you to uh, an old, old, old actor that I love from Hollywood way back in the 1930s and 40s, if you ever watch old movies. And... He has the most apt name, perhaps, in history. His name was Donald Meek. He was uh, five foot five. He weighed literally 81 pounds. He had the scarlet fever when he was quite young, and that caused him to lose all his hair. So he was bald. He looked like this little nebbish guy. And he excelled at playing mousy, timid, shy, unassertive, henpecked, browbeaten, you can fill in the adjectives if you want to, type characters. Just always going to get trampled on. Always afraid of what's going to happen next. Never able to speak up. Never able to give voice to what it is that he really thought or wanted. He was in a lot of great movies, including Stagecoach. Stagecoach is the movie that made John Wayne a star. And Donald Meek was great character to have as kind of a foil to John Wayne because he made John Wayne look that much bigger and stronger and tougher. And we live in a world system, see, that says, uh, blessed be the John Waynes of our world that are big and strong and handsome and rich and famous and tough and assertive and confident and winners of the genetic lottery. Because see, the question is always, all great teachers have to deal with this question, and this is what Jesus is dealing with in the Sermon on the Mount. To whom is the good life available? Well, to John Wayne. And woe be to Donald Me, the timid, the shy, the unassertive, the retiring, the frightened, the mousy, the meek. And now Jesus comes along and he is not saying here, the good news is that you can become just like Donald Meek. The idea is not to be passive or to try to be more shy or to try to be more timid. That word meek is kind of a mixed word and there are positive aspects to it, but quite often it has the same connotation that it does in our day. The good news of Jesus is not that you're going to be like that or that you ought to want to be like that. The good news is precisely even to people like that, to whom the world thinks that good life is, has passed them by. Nope, it has not. Donald Meek, the kingdom of heaven is coming to you. Now, uh, as is often the case with the Beatitudes, there is an Old Testament context to this one. And um, in... Psalm 37, uh, the psalmist is talking to people who are struggling because the people that are inherited of the earth don't seem like they're very good people. So the psalmist says, do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. They're playing a game and the game is called mine and the game is called take. The game is called if somebody else hurt you, you hurt them back and they're pretty good at it. Don't be envious of them, the psalmist says. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. There is a spiritual reality that is at work in our universe, and we may or may not see the outcomes in our own lifetime, but it is there, the psalmist says. Psalm thirty-seven, eleven. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Why will this happen? Well, it's not because the meek are so going to get really, really good at taking it away. 
The kingdom of God is coming. Justice is coming. Love is coming. And as God acts in the lives of the meek, if they receive it, if they receive that kingdom, then when they inherit the land, their response is not mine, finally. It's not take, grab, hold. It's now I will share. Now I will help. Now I will love. So I want to give you a little picture of the blessed life, blessed of the meek, for theirs too is the kingdom of heaven. And this is what it looks like to live in the kingdom of heaven. This is from a book called Taking the Word to Heart by Robert Roberts. And uh, he's talking about a man, Jim Roberts, family therapist, who visited his fourth grade uh, son's class where the teacher had organized a game that was called a balloon stomp, as you might guess from the title. Each child had a balloon tied on his or her leg, and the object was to obliterate everybody else's balloon without letting anything happen to yours. It was every man for himself and each against all. As soon as somebody stomped you, you were out. And the child who still had a plump, glistening balloon when everybody else's hung limp and tattered would have the winner's glory. We have seen in the Sermon on the Mount how Jesus' method of teaching generally was not to give engineering laws or commandments that are to be applied mechanically or legalistically, um, but actually to pierce general prevailing assumptions. You can go back and listen to that talk if you haven't heard it yet. And, and this game, like all human games, have general prevailing assumptions. It's me against you, every man for himself. Got to look out for number one, mine, take. That's the human system. Teacher gave the signal. The children leapt ferociously on each other's balloons, doing their best, meanwhile, to protect themselves against the onslaught of others. All that is, except one or two who lacked the spirit of competition. They were just dismayed by all the hullabaloo. And their balloons were predictably laid waste. They were the meek. In a few seconds, all balloons were burst but one. Then a disturbing thing happened. Another class, this time a class of mentally handicapped children, was brought in and prepared to play the same game. Balloons were tied to their legs and they were briefed on the rules of play. Said Roberts, I got a sinking feeling in my midsection. I wanted to spare these kids the pressure of a competitive brawl. They had only the foggiest notion of what this was all about. After a few moments of confusion, the idea got across to one or two of them that the balloons were supposed to be stomped, and gradually it caught on. But as the game got underway, it was clear these kids had missed the spirit of it. They went about methodically getting their balloons stomped. One girl carefully held her own in place so that a boy could pop it, and then he did the same for her. When all the balloons were gone, the entire class cheered in unison. These children had mistaken the rule of a game, but their error has some advantages. In the original game, only one child could win, but they discovered how to make everybody a winner. In normal balloon stopping, the participants are alienated from one another. It's you against me. But as these children played it, the game was an occasion for camaraderie. Instead of feeling anxious about fellow players, you know the others are there to help you along. In the original game, you wouldn't be likely to learn love. But the play of these children seemed to foster generosity, trust, cooperation, gentleness, and concern for one another. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, uh, that's not to say that competition is always a bad thing in athletics or business or a lot of fields. When it's done with the right kind of spirit, it can call out the best of us. It can stimulate us and energize us. It can be a really good and joyful and wonderful thing. But, 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 man, sin enters into it so fast. And I turn my life into a never-ending struggle to try to prove my worth and my significance and the other becomes my enemy. And then I feel envious and I compare myself to other people 
And there is no winning at that game. Jesus brings the another game with another spirit, and he calls it the kingdom of heaven. And it only has one rule, the golden rule. So now today you play that game. Who can I help today? In particular, who looks like they might be struggling? Who looks like they might be feeling a little meek today? How can I come alongside them, do them a favor, care for some activity that matters to them, run an errand, write a note, express love, make it a golden rule day, because the kingdom of heaven is coming, even to the meek. If you like hearing John talk about the Sermon on the Mount, we've got a whole series on that. So go ahead and subscribe to make sure you don't miss any future episodes in that series. You can also go back and catch up on any episodes that you may have missed. Now, if you're interested in the email or the text alert that goes along with each episode, you can let us know at becomenew.com slash subscribe, and we'll make sure that you get those. If you want to help us spread the word about Become New, the best way to do it is just to watch, like, and comment each video that we put out. So we would love to hear your thoughts. If you want to chime in in the comments, that would help us, and we'd love to engage with you there. Lastly, if you've got a prayer request, there's a group of us who meet each weekday to pray for viewers just like yourself. You can send us your prayer request to the number 855-888-0444, and we would love to pray for you. We'll catch you next time.